Grace and peace to you in the name of God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 As we continue to share signs and words of God's peace, again, it's a pleasure for me to be here with you. And I, I want to thank my, my new friends, Glenn and Kathy, for their wonderful hospitality last night and uh, putting me up and taking care of me. And, uh, and for you, for the opportunity to be here with you. Uh, Mel and I go back a long way. We had a, a common friend, and I was delighted to hear that he was coming into the ministry when he did. And so you got a great pastor in Mel Hazelwood. I know you know that. Amen. And the song I want to share is uh, it's based on Scripture, and you'll probably recognize most of the words. And I just kind of rearranged things a little bit. It's about the blessing that God offers each and every one of us and all of us together. And it's a sing-along song, and it starts with the chorus, and you don't know the words. But, um, you know, after you've heard the chorus a few times, if you're picking it up and you want to sing along or you want to clap or anything, I hope that you will. So it's called Living Water. <laughs> Some of that living water, water from the well that don't run dry. Give me some of that living water. I need the truth, and that ain't no lie. Now, there was a woman down at Jacob's well. Too many problems, it was a living hell. Lord, come along, who's looking for a drink? He says, man, I'm thirsty. Oh, she could think she's asking, give me some of that. Living water, water from the well that don't run dry. Give me some of that. Living water, I need the truth, and that ain't no lie. Jacob wrestling with the angel in the middle of the night. Put a hip out of joint, it was a heck of a fight. Jacob said, man, you know you hurt me so. Do you bless my name? I won't let you go. You got to give me some of that. Living water, water from the well that don't run dry. Give me some of that. Living water, I need the truth and that ain't no lie. The Lord said, everybody coming to me, I'm giving you life and making it free. So when you get tired, when you get poor, you call my name, I'll be at your door. Say, give me some of that living water, water from the well that don't run dry. Give me some of that living water, I need the truth and that that living water water from the well that don't run dry give me some of that living water i need the truth and that ain't no lie give me some of that living water water from the well that don't run dry give me some of that living Everlasting life. Amen. Thank you. In the name of God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, will you stand with me in, in your Bibles on, uh, let me make sure this is right. Yes. Luke 15, 1 through 3, and then we're going to go to 11. So, uh, if you'll just... Follow along and hear God's word. Now the tax collector and sinners were all gathered around to hear him. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told this parable. One of you has a... One of you... And then we go, Jesus is talking to 11b. There was a man who had two sons... 
The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had and set off for a distant country and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to the fields to feed the pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his census, he said, How many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer am worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servant, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Bring a ring and put it on his finger and sandals on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they begin to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near to the house, he heard the music and dancing So he called to one of the servants and asked what was going on. Your brother has come home, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf. And because he has come back safe and sound, the old brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he asked his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet, you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes come home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is now alive. He was lost and is now found. This is the word of the Lord. Stand with me in in your Bible. It was 10 or 12 years ago, my wife and Our children and myself were living in Luling, Texas. I was pastoring the United Methodist Church there. Luling's a great town. You can get most things you need there. They have an (laughs) H-E-B. But they didn't have a Walmart. And there were other things that they didn't have, and so we would find ourselves traveling to San Marcos from time to time so the girls could shop. So we could get all the other things that we needed. They enjoyed the, you know, it's the little town itself, and they really enjoyed the outlet malls, and so that's where they would go. San Marcos from Luling, there's a little road you travel. I don't remember which one it is now. Is it 21? 20. It's 20 that we would travel, and you see a lot of things on these little Texas roads. (laughs) Things that you would expect to see, like small farms and small ranches and businesses, There used to be a bakery there, the Blue Ribbon. Is it still around? I don't know, but it was a great place to go. And all those things you would expect to see, and once in a while you'd come across something that you did not expect, like the airplane 
that was stuck with its nose in the dirt and its tail in the air in a plowed field. If I'm not mistaken, it was on that road. And you looked at that and you wondered what in the world, you know, you did a double take the first time you saw that thing. And then you saw the sign that was next to it, the sign that read, there's no such thing as a perfectly good airplane. Learn to skydive. <laughs> Apparently that little sign worked because, you know, you'd drive down that road and you'd look and something would catch your eye and there would be another small plane hovering around up in the sky and and then you'd see people jumping out and the parachutes opening and they'd drift down to the, to the plowed field, which was a target area for the, for the skydivers. No perfectly good airplane learned to skydive. You know, that's not a bad plan B to have. You know, and, and, and if life is a skydive, then, then what do you need? You need a parachute. You know, that's the thing I've always thought. And I always wondered about these friends of mine who would take me up in their small planes. They never offered me a parachute. <laughs> and, and some of those small planes, like the one that Larry Hoskins flies, a Starduster from Larry from, from, uh, from Luling, you know, the passenger flies in the front and the pilot is in the back. And I thought, explain to me how this works. But anyway, learn to skydive. It's good to have a plan B. It's good to feel at least to feel like everything is okay, like someone's in control. And no matter what happens and how badly things might go, it's okay. Well, I believe that's grace. I believe this skydive through life, if you will, as we go through the skydive we call life, we know that God is with us, do we not? Don't we know that wherever we go and no matter what we do, whether we're you know, riding to California or taking off in the airplane or, or, or just walking out to, to get the mail and come back in, coming back inside to spend the rest of the day. God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Grace is here and grace is now. Well, this text that we're reading here this morning, for me, highlights grace. It's one of these classic illustrations of the grace of God, the presence of God and the love of God for anyone and everyone in all times and all places. So Jesus tells this parable, and yet before we get to the parable, we can also remember the circumstances that lead Jesus to tell this parable. It seems that he had been carrying on with some of the folks who the, the good folks in the community weren't so happy about. He'd been carrying on and even eating with the tax collectors and the sinners. Now, in that time and place, that was kind of the riffraff, if you will. The tax collectors were people who kind of walked both sides of the fence. They'd come and collect taxes for the Roman government. The Roman government was oppressive as far as the Jewish people were concerned. And when the tax collector would show up at your door... Well, you wouldn't really know, was he collecting the, the exact amount of tax or was he going to cut you a deal or was he going to charge a little more? But tax collectors were known to live pretty high on the hog and so they were not well liked. Sinners were everybody who didn't go to church, if you don't mind me using that expression, though the church was still being called together in that time and place. The sinners were the folks who wouldn't go to temple and wouldn't come to worship because they wouldn't pay to make the sacrifice that the priests were, de were demanding. The sinners were the folks who didn't, who didn't follow all the religious rules as the Pharisees, the religious experts, and the scribes were writing those things up. Do you remember Jesus talking about, oh, you scribes and Pharisees, you bind heavy burdens on people's backs, but you yourself will not lift one finger to help? Well, these are the folks who are noticing that Jesus has been sitting down and rubbing elbows with all these, these folks that they thought were second-class citizens. He's sitting down, and he's eating with them. What's the big deal, you know, we ask ourselves? Can't you sit down and eat with anybody, anytime, any place? Well, in that time and place, and according to that custom, if you sat down and ate with someone, that meant that you were family. You were as close as brother and sister. And Jesus is rubbing elbows, sitting down and eating with these folks who, who the other folks thought were really not worth their time. They would not be caught dead sitting down and being anywhere near these kinds of people. And here Jesus was. They're muttering to each other. And, and, and you can hear them talking. Can you believe that? Look who he's with today. Can you believe that he'd spend his time with such a person? 
Well, we can fill in all the gaps for ourselves, but that's what's going on. And Jesus must have heard this muttering that was going on, this murmuring, this gossiping. And so he tells this parable. He says, it's like this. It's like a man who had two sons, a younger one and an older one. And the younger one came to, to dad one day and said, dad, I'm ready to split and I want what I've got coming to me. I want my share of the estate. What he's telling his father at this point is he really doesn't care about his dad anymore. To, to get down to the nitty gritty, what he's really, really telling dad is, dad, you might as well be dead as far as I'm concerned. Just go ahead and give me what I've got coming. And so dad says, okay. And he splits it up, he gives him what he has coming to him, and the younger son goes off, and he, he spends everything that he's been given in pretty loose living. Again, fill in the gaps. Wine, women, and song, however you want to put that, he's having a grand old time out there by himself until the money disappears. I'm thinking, I'm thinking you know, friends are the kind of friends that you have when uh, as long as the money's running, as long as the drinks are flowing, as long as the music is playing, as long as uh, the, the, the girls, the ladies are there and everybody's having a good time, then we're all big buddies. But now the money runs out and the friends are gone, and he finds himself broke, destitute, just to make a living, just to have something to eat. He's out here feeding pigs. This is the lowest of the low for a Jewish person. He's out here eat, feeding pigs, and he's, and he's hungry, and he would have gladly fed himself on the pods that the pigs were eating, and then it hits him. You know, if I just go back home, Maybe my dad will receive me. Maybe he'll take me back in. And he doesn't feel worthy in any way. He's thinking, I don't deserve to be called a child, a son, an heir anymore, but maybe he'll just take me and give me something to do. At least I'll have a roof over my head and clothes to wear, food to eat, something. And so he goes home. And maybe you remember the story how, how, he's, how he gets home and while he's, while he's going, the, the servants look and they see him coming and, the, and they tell the father and the father is overjoyed because for him, as far as he was concerned, his son was as good as dead and here comes his son. Kill the fatted calf, make merry, the son comes in. Can you imagine the way that he feels as he's welcomed back into this household? As he realizes now how much his father cares for him and loves him, he puts a robe on him. He puts a ring on his finger, a symbol that he's still part of the family, and they make merry. What if a wonderful time to be welcomed in in that way. Well, I'm thinking to myself, isn't that kind of what the church ought to be doing for everybody in our time and place? Isn't that that grace that will lead us home? I once was lost, but now I'm found well, how does that go? Yeah. Grace will lead me home. Grace will lead us all home. Maybe you've been there. Maybe you've done that. Maybe you've experienced that kind of a, that kind of a warm reception, having gotten to the end of your rope, and then you realize that there are people who care about you, and there is a God who cares about you. Thomas Merton was a Trappist monk who wrote his own faith autobiography. He called it the Seven Story Mountain. Merton was a Trappist monk, but he did not begin his life in that way. In fact, his earlier life drew parallels to the life of this prodigal son who we're talking about this morning. Merton shares his own life story very plainly in that book. He finds himself at a crossroads, and he has this to say about that time in his life. <clears throat> If my nature had been more stubborn in clinging to the pleasures that disgusted me, if I had refused to admit that I was beaten by this futile search for satisfaction where it could not be found, and if my moral and nervous constitution had not caved in under the weight of my own emptiness, who could tell where I would have ended? I had come very far to find myself in this blind alley, and it was my defeat that was to be the occasion of my rescue. It was my defeat that was to be the occasion of my rescue. Thomas Merton talks about having reached a point where he life was like a blind alley. I'm thinking like this prodigal, this younger son who found himself in his own blind alley. 
And yet that itself was the grace that began to lead him home. He finds himself at home. He finds grace. He finds mercy. He finds forgiveness. And so anyone and everyone can find that same grace. Well, that'd be great if everyone accepted that and believed that, but you know we don't all. The elder brother, if you remember this parable that Jesus is telling, now the elder brother already has it all, and he's so upset when he sees a younger brother welcomed back in as a son and an heir again. And he's complaining to his father, and, he's, and, and you can imagine the language. He's saying, really? Dad? <laughs> I mean, here I've been all this time. You know, every day, sunrise to sundown, I'm here. I'm helping you on the place. I'm doing the work. Do I complain? Well, you know, okay, next question. Uh, you know, what have I ever done? I'm doing my best to please you, Dad. And yet this son of yours, notice that he does not say this brother of mine. This son of yours goes out and lives as loosely as he possibly can, and you welcome him home. You kill the calf. Dad, you won't even give me a cabrito for my birthday party, and you kill the fatted calf for him. What am I supposed to think, Dad? What am I supposed to do? What does Dad say to the elder brother? He says, son, everything I have is already yours, but this brother of yours, he was as good as dead. And now he's alive again. We have to make a party. Don't stand outside. Come and join us. Come be part of the celebration. Well, I had a professor say to us one time, you know it's nice when a sermon says something about God. <laughs> and I agree with that. And that professor was complaining about all the stories, some of which you've been hearing today. <laughs> And, and all the stories about what I did on my summer vacation and all those kinds of things and yet never say anything about God. What is this story saying to us? Maybe Jesus is saying grace is for everyone. Grace is for sky pilots taking a free fall through life, not even knowing if their parachute's going to open. And grace is for all of the stay-at-home, safe and sound brothers and sisters who do their very best to live faithfully. Because God is here and God is now and God loves us all just the same. There is enough grace for everyone. Do we know that? Do we receive that? Whatever end of this spiritual spectrum we find ourselves on, do we know that grace will lead us home? Well, I wish I could tell you that yours truly remembers that all the time, but yours truly does not always remember that all the time. And so I was in Austin one day on business, and I was down on uh, South Congress at one of my favorite little hangouts called Fran's Hamburgers. There's Fran's, and then there's Dan's, and uh, Fran and Dan used to work together, and then they split the sheets, and now Dan does his thing, and Fran does hers. And I was on South Congress, and it was in between lunch and supper, which is a real tragedy because I love their, I, I like to get the, the, the baby double, the double meat, double cheese, and not a whole lot of bread, but everything else is on there. And it was in between times and it was a beautiful day. And I was writing a line to a song and sitting outside and drinking on a Diet Coke. And then I was aware of another presence and I looked up and there was a man who was approaching me. And he looked to be a street person because of the, the way that he was, just his general condition, he, he, he looked like he was having some hard times. And so I kind of noticed him with one eye, and he walked right at me, and he held up a sign, and, and it didn't say, learn to skydive. <laughs> it said, I'm deaf. And I didn't read the rest of the sign. I can't tell you what the rest of it said because I just looked back down to my paper as if I was going to continue to write. And he approached me, and I didn't look up, and I just waved him off. And the man turned around. He began to walk away. And as he did, I could hear the sounds of anger and despair as he stomped down the street. And a minute or so passed, and I was cut to the heart by what I'd seen and what I'd heard. And I closed my notebook and I put it in my pickup and I, and I went down the street hoping to find the man to see what can I do to help. This man would appreciate anything I can do to help. And yet I couldn't find him anywhere. He was gone. 
And I was too late. Of all people, I was too late. Well, what do you do when you find yourself as part of that faith community, that religious community, and you realize what's going on, and you know for yourself how grace is for everyone in all times, in all places? Maybe that elder son is like us, you know, the faith community. And so many times we refuse to look beyond ourselves to the ones all around us who are, who are already being welcomed by God the Father. May we see that that very same grace that God offers to everyone else is for us as well. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. God is grace, and grace is good. A little grace is really good, and a lot of grace is is even better. And it's that grace of God that never ends that I give God thanks and praise for today. Amen.